It's poverty. It's crime. Unemployment. Corruption. Accountability. The energy crisis. Inflation. We are worried. That South Africa has myriad problems on all fronts is a given. But the time has come for us to look for real solutions. I'm Jeremy Maggs, and this MoneyWeb podcast will discuss those solutions on how South Africans can solve problems by having tough conversations and drawing on the insights of South Africa's top business leaders. Welcome to Fix SA. My guest this week says the beauty of mathematics is that it inculcates in one ways of thinking systematically and innovatively about the widest range of challenges. And it's those two qualities that I think are perhaps most needed when it comes to getting things right in South Africa. Welcome to Fix SA right here on MoneyWeb. I'm Jeremy Maggs, where we ask our guests how we can make things better in the country. How do we improve matters? How in the shortest space of time can we become a competitive and successful nation once again? And I'm going to introduce you now to Professor Sizwe Mabizela, who became the Vice Chancellor of Rhodes University in 2014, if memory serves correctly. And a few years after that, he said that middle classes are being squeezed out, making universities only available to the very poor and the very rich. I'm wondering if things have changed in that respect. Professor, the warmest of welcomes to you, and thank you so much for talking to us. So let's wade straight in. The fundamental role of universities in the socioeconomic development of South Africa, how important are they and are they meeting that challenge, do you think? Thank you very much, Jeremy, uh, for the opportunity. First, I must commend you on these podcasts, which focus on fixing our country. There are many challenges that face us, and all of these challenges notwithstanding, we should never allow apathy, despair, cynicism, and despondency to take hold in our country. And we, we can't afford to lose hope, and we can't afford not to imagine a better society. Indeed, Jeremy, universities are critical institutions in a society, uh, and they are very important for the socioeconomic development of of our country. As you know, uh, universities are knowledge institutions, and they are hubs of innovation. So they are fundamentally about creating and disseminating knowledge. And so we do need to be sure, certainly as universities, that we produce young people, young graduates, with the necessary skills, knowledge, and competencies to serve our society and humanity, and indeed to help us address the socioeconomic challenges of our country. So we nurture skilled and knowledgeable young people. So that is one part. The other part, of course, is that uh, we generate new knowledge, and that is absolutely critical uh, for economic advancement and technological advancement of our country. And this knowledge is intended to address some of the present and urgent challenges uh, that face us. Equally critical, Jeremy, universities have to produce knowledge that advances human understanding, wisdom, and what it means to be fully human. Professor, all of that is very important. It's also very high-minded. What I'm wondering, as you tell me how important universities are, whether practically you believe right now, given the myriad problems that South Africa is facing, whether they are contributing to fixing systemic issues within South African society. Are they rising to that challenge sufficiently and, I guess, speedily enough? Most certainly, Jeremy, they are rising to the challenge. It's a difficult challenge, but they are playing their rightful role in addressing some of the uh, most vexing challenges of our society. As as we know, Jeremy, universities are not islands. They are an integral part of our society and the community in which uh, they find themselves. So as knowledge institutions, as I've indicated, we generate and disseminate knowledge that seeks to respond to our societal challenges. So we are doing that right away. 
we are producing wonderful graduates who are able to be agents of change and societal transformation, young people who are not content with the society as it is, but can imagine a better society and go beyond that and work with courage and conviction to change our society for the better. And of course, in terms of uh, research, we are producing research that seeks to address some of the challenges that face our society. And I'm very pleased uh, that we are able to do that as Rhodes University and as one of 26 public universities, we are all playing our part to create a society of our dreams. So, Professor, in that respect, then, what do you think are the big problems in this country that need fixing, uh, and particularly where universities can wade in and help? Well, first, of course, is the issue of skills shortages. Uh, We are producing competent and capable young people who are able to uh, contribute towards uh, uh, addressing the socioeconomic challenges. Uh, Secondly, in terms of research, Much of the research that is done in this country seeks to address some of the local challenges that we face, but we are not being parochial. We are generating knowledge that endeavors to respond to our pressing and urgent needs, but also simultaneously contributing to our accumulated global stock of knowledge. And certainly in terms of research, as you might know, uh, South Africa is at the forefront of the square kilometer array. That huge and the biggest scientific instrument to have ever been built to help us understand our past, but also to contribute in scientific knowledge. So we are doing that and we are also assisting young people to create employment, not only for themselves, but for others as well. Professor, there's no doubt that uh, the skills deficit in this country in many respects has reached crisis proportions. And part of that is perhaps a a lack of engagement, a lack of performance when it comes to the so-called STEM subjects, which is right up your alley as, as a mathematician. Why do you think at all levels we are failing in that respect? And again, how do we start uh, right sizing that particular problem? Jeremy, one of the biggest challenges we face is in respect of our basic education. Young people lack foundational knowledge, particularly when it comes to mathematics and science. Uh, The young people who manage to get to the end of grade 12 is a very tiny percentage, and even fewer do mathematics and science. And so the first thing that we really need to address if we are to build the society that we imagine, if we are to fix South Africa, we must fix basic education. Starting from early childhood education and grade R and foundation phase, ensure that young people can read with comprehension and ensure that we build numeracy skills at that very young age. Because if we can build that foundation, those young people will be able to complete their grade 12 with mathematics and science. And as you might know, the so-called Asian tigers, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, were able to develop their economies largely on the back of harnessing science and technology. But as we extol the virtues of the STEM disciplines, let me hasten to acknowledge the importance of the humanities and the arts as they teach us what it means to be fully human. And so if we pursue STEM disciplines to the exclusion of the humanities and the arts, we would run the risk of producing technically competent young graduates who lack the essential soft skills. In other words, they'll just be robots. So in terms of the skills that we need for the 21st century economy, you need the STEM disciplines. And I think we are not producing enough teachers who can teach these at a young age and excite young people about mathematics and science so that they're able to 
develop the necessary skills and the necessary knowledge for innovation and for creating knowledge that responds to the 21st century challenges. Professor Mabizela, notwithstanding the importance of the humanities, and uh, as a practicing journalist, that is certainly within my uh, area of interest. I am wondering, though, whether the focus hasn't switched too much to the humanities, whether we uh, don't need a recalibration to taking the STEM subjects and the teaching thereof a lot more seriously, almost to shift the weight, shift the balance until we can start getting better at that, which then as you've just said, would make us a lot more globally competitive to be able to stand alongside those Asian tigers. Yeah, absolutely. We need to invest a lot more time, a lot more energy, and a lot more imagination in ensuring that more young people pick up the STEM subjects because they are important. All I'm saying is that even as we do that, let us not neglect the social sciences and the humanities and the no. arts because they are just so important. So you are right. In fact, we have more young people doing humanities. In fact, our university has the highest proportion of young people who are registered in the Faculty of Humanities. And this is by default because uh, of the fact that many of those young people have had no exposure to quality teaching in mathematics and science. And so they end up uh, pursuing the, the humanities. I agree with you totally. We need to do a lot more to increase the pool of young people who are excited about mathematics and science and the importance of these disciplines to ensure technological advan advancement of, of our country so that we can become uh, competitive. As I have indicated, the 21st century economy requires those skills. Professor, let's talk a little bit about uh, that excitement around mathematics and science and increasing the pool. And maybe this is a good opportunity for you to tell us your story. How did you become not only excited by the subject, but uh, also highly skilled in it? Jeremy, I was very fortunate uh, from a very young age to have good teachers. A and I really want to emphasize the centrality of the teacher in the teaching and learning enterprise. And many of us can think back to that one teacher who made things so exciting for us. So I was very fortunate for, from early grades to have good teachers who encouraged us to do mathematics, to enjoy mathematics, and all the way up to grade 12. And so it just became natural uh, for me to, to do mathematics and so pursued it uh, up to PhD level. But I really must emphasize that teachers play a critical role in encouraging young people to pursue certain directions and uh, in that regard, I think I was very fortunate, and I'm hoping that we can have more mathematics and science teachers who can inspire those young people and make them believe that they can indeed do mathematics and do science. And as you know, given our past, uh, Hendrik Fervoot was of the view that it was pointless to teach a black child mathematics because uh, he would not use it. But we also took that as a challenge, Jeremy. And so we tried to excel in mathematics, if only to prove the point that uh, uh, what the apartheid designs had in mind was not correct. So I do, again, want to underline the importance of the teacher, a competent, capable, enthusiastic teacher who has good command of their discipline uh, is a huge inspiration to young people. So what do you think, apart from that, makes a good teacher, apart from having a, a good command of the discipline? What else is it? Of course, uh, it, it must be someone who is able to care and be compassionate and be able to spot those young people whom uh, he or she believes can be nurtured and can be supported in pursuing mathematics and science. 
again, it was really important for us at at that young age that we were given uh, challenging problems. And of course, there were problems given to the rest of the class. And uh, those at the top end had to do harder problems, uh, which was very stimulating and very challenging. And so we would meet with the teacher afterwards and share with him our solutions to the problems, which, of course, further builds our confidence in mathematics. Because if you are in that situation, you really, really enjoy that stimulation Mm -hmm. and that challenge. Professor, I want to pivot the conversation slightly if I can. I, I did reference a quote that was attributed to you, I think it was in 2015, where you spoke about universities were only available to the very poor and the very rich. If we're going to fix South Africa, universities have got to address the issue of accessibility and affordability for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. I would suggest to you, Professor, that we're, we're not getting that right at all, and that is one of the major your problems uh, as to why we find ourselves with the skills deficit. Yeah, again, you're you're right, uh, Jeremy. That is a big problem. When I made that comment, it was in the context where many academically capable young people who happened to fall outside of the National Student Financial Aid Scheme were not catered for. We did not have any financially sustainable uh, and affordable mechanism to fund those. These are young people whose total family income is above the 350,000 threshold. We still don't have that at the moment. And these are young people who are born of civil servants, nurses, teachers, and so on. And it does break my heart that we are still to come up with an appropriate mechanism to address these young people so that funding does not become an impediment for them to access quality and transformative education. Earlier this year, the Minister of Higher Education and Training announced an introduction of a loan scheme, uh, which is intended to address uh, this matter. But I don't think that we have fully thought through what the implications will be for that scheme. But of course, we do welcome the the opportunity for young people, particularly those who come from the so-called missing middle. These are young people whose family income is above the 350,000 rand, but not nearly enough to can afford university education. I see them every day, Jeremy. They are here, they are registered. And so uh, as a university, we have made a particular arrangement, particularly for those who are doing well academically. We are allowing them to register and we are arranging with their families to pay that which they can afford and really demand one thing of the students, that they do well academically. And if they pass, they will proceed to the next level will roll over the debt even as they continue to make their own contribution until they they finish. There are just so many of mm. them, but of course, that is not sustainable. Well, that's exactly we the need... point, Professor. It, it, it's a very noble intention, but uh, that is not a sustainable solution by any means, is it? it? It is not. It is not a sustainable solution, but it has even been compounded by the recent changes in the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, where they have put a cap on accommodation costs for students, and it actually impacts largely uh, those who come from poor and disadvantaged communities because now they can't afford to live on university residences. They leave the university and they live far away from the university where they try to find the cheapest possible accommodation, no Wi-Fi, no facilities. Mm. And more than that, and I think this is a statement about the levels of poverty in our society, the meager allowances that they receive are also used to support their families back home. 
And it is just so heartbreaking because it means that these young people will not be able to finish on time because they have been subjected to this situation. And so it is not sustainable, but we raise funds and to the extent possible, uh, try to alleviate the the plight of those who are in financial distress. But one thing, Jeremy, that I could not bear to see is a young person who is performing well, except, who is performing exceptionally well in their courses, who has to take a year off, try to raise funds to come back and study for one year and go back and forth. And so, again, I really want to emphasize the need for us to develop a financially affordable and sustainable mechanism to fund many of these academically deserving young people who are not catered for uh, by the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. And Professor, before I move the conversation on, I think I speak for both of us when uh, I say that uh, people who find themselves in that very difficult position need to be acknowledged and, and respected because it is a huge, huge burden that they are bearing on very young shoulders. Moving on, um, you are a leader, Professor Mabizela, of both faculty and students. I want to talk a little bit about leadership and the qualities that you think South African leaders need to possess to effectively address the difficulties that we're facing and, again, lead us towards some sort of fix. Mm, mm, mm. Jeremy, I firmly believe that we must be led by people for whom leadership is an opportunity to serve and to do so with honor, integrity, and humility. Not selfish, not self-serving leadership. Secondly, I'm of the firm view that we need bold, courageous, and accountable leaders. Leaders who are able to take decisions no matter how unpopular they may be, and still be accountable for their leadership. And thirdly, I think we need leadership that inspires people, not just to have confidence in the leadership, but for people to have confidence in themselves. And of course, we do need moral and ethical leaders. We have been let down as a society and as a nation. We have elevated into positions of power and responsibility some leaders of questionable character, people who were bereft of any moral rectitude. And we know where we have been. And so we do need to inculcate this kind of leadership. And we do that at Rhodes University with our young people young people who will be able to provide leadership in our in their companies in our society and more broadly ethical leaders who see leadership as nothing more than an opportunity to serve that for me is important professor i i wonder as you give me that very eloquent answer why you think we've lost that uh concept of morality and accountability and whether you think there's still time and hope for us to recover it. There is great hope that we can recover that. Uh, there are many people in our society who are doing tremendous work, who are leaders, without any political position or anything. And I'm inspired by the remarkable resilience and commitment of these ordinary South Africans who do extraordinary things every single day. We are an amazing society. And in fact, at some stage, uh, Bishop Tutu uh, commented that uh, our society is a scintillating success waiting to happen. So there are many in our society who are leaders in their own spaces. And those are the people who inspire me. And indeed, there are many who just get on with things that need to be done. And I think we can draw a lot of inspiration from these ordinary citizens of our country. 
Professor Mabizela, a final question to you. And given that this podcast is principally aimed at a business audience, I'd like you to reflect, if you can, on the importance of the collaboration between universities and the business sector, the private sector, in driving innovation and economic growth in South Africa, and whether you think it's happening effectively or not. More can be done. I think that, of course, the collaboration is absolutely important. This collaboration between the private sector and universities is absolutely crucial uh, in driving innovation and economic growth of our country. Um, I indicated in the beginning that universities are hubs of innovation. And so building and sustaining partnerships and collaboration between the private sector and universities will contribute significantly to economic growth and and innovation. Uh, And of course, it will be partly pursuing collaborative research initiatives uh, with the private sector. I can indicate that from a university side, we desperately need funding to do research and the private sector can assist in that regard. We need bursaries for postgraduate bursaries, people who are who are pursuing masters and doctoral studies, who are generating new knowledge. But of course, the universities can in turn provide cutting edge technological solutions that can benefit the private sector. Is this happening enough in our country? I do not believe so. I think much more can be done. I do believe that the private sector may be a bit reticent uh, in investing in research in higher education institutions. But I really, really believe that that is an incredible opportunity that still needs to be explored and the full benefits thereof uh, realized. Why do you think the private sector is reticent? Jeremy, I imagine the reticence comes largely because of the state of our nation. Uh, when you see all manner of problems in every direction and you realize that we are not making much progress to resolving them, I think it, I think private sector becomes very hesitant about firmly entrenching their roots in a country where there are certain levels of uncertainty. Um, and I, I think... The sooner we sort out some of these things like uh, load shedding and, uh, you know, corruption and malfeasance and all of those things, and we get back on track, we started off very well, Jeremy. And somewhere along the way, we lost uh, our direction. But uh, I think we still have the opportunity. As your podcast indicates, it's about fixing our country, South Africa. So we can fix that. Everyone can feel confident about this country and its future. And then the private sector will be able to invest uh, in our institutions and be able to derive the benefits of research that is produced by our universities and all the innovative technological solutions that can propel us to even greater heights. And I think that is an excellent place to put a punctuation point on this conversation. The Vice-Chancellor of Rhodes University in Makanda in the Eastern Cape, Professor Sizwe Mabisela, thank you very much for talking to me right here on Monday. Thanks for listening to this Fix SA podcast. For more episodes posted every second Friday, go to moneyweb.co.za, the MoneyWeb app, Apple Podcasts and Spotify or follow MoneyWeb News on social media for more updates. MoneyWeb, your trusted source for business and investment insights.